Space, the final frontier. Or is it? It's everywhere, and it's nowhere. So let me ask you, why should you care? It's there. Who cares? Well, for me, and I hope for you, you'll take a, a voyage of the mind with me for the next few minutes, because I think space is personal. It's the next big thing. We've had the internet, we had plastics, now it's time to think about space. And so I want to ask you to just bear with me for a minute as we look back 50 years and then project ahead 50. Because in 50 years, 2069, how we will have reacted to the opportunities of space, to the business models it offers, to the questions it raises that we haven't known to ask, I think will influence our lives in ways that we can't even measure. So let's look back for a minute. 50 years ago, against all odds, some brave people led by a charismatic president said we're going to the moon, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. And we went, perhaps 50 years ahead of its time. 50 years ahead of its time, we sent human beings, basically uh, emissaries of ourselves, to another world. And we saw what it had to offer. It rewrote our mind's thinking about space. We saw the Earth, as you see behind me, as a spaceship Earth carrying three and a half billion people with it. And we saw the moon, a record book of Earth that told us of what we can't see on our home planet. It told of resources and things that we can only hope to have seen. The moon opened our eyes to the universe. It's a masterpiece moon. And even if it's gray and dull, it gave us that inspiration to realize there are things happening in space that affect us every second. So let's ask what those are. First, our space, the space we see, is a fundamentally collisional environment. Energy from the sun, cosmic collisions that affect us at every scale at every second, sometimes big enough to have changed the course of the history of life. As one great Yankee fan said, Stephen Jay Gould, if you played the tape backwards, we would not be here. And those cosmic collisions are preserved on the moon as kind of the Earth's attic, and yet on Earth we don't remember those. So space opened our eyes. And we went to space 50 years ago, not with business models of today, with no internet, barely a digital generation. And that gave us the opportunity to test ideas, to stimulate, inspire, to generate a knowledge commodity potential. And beyond the moon and what we learned in space, awakening to that, there is another destination, the destination of Mars. It's had that allure for a long time for us. We see it as a red dot in the wandering in the night sky. It was written about in the 19th century as a place of canals and Martians, Barsumits, all those kind of folks. And we see it today in a different light because in the last 20 years, folks, we have come to know the new Mars. Now, we had the new math in the 60s. Um, this new Mars that's emerging is more than the polar sterile deserts that we first saw in the 70s. It's a reawakening, and it's an opportunity, because Mars presents a potential biological frontier. And what you see is not quite what you get. The Mars you see when you get there, and when you carry yourselves there in the eyes and ears of our robotic emissaries, those extensions of ourselves that now allow us to explore space, kind of like science fiction. We're not quite basically a warp generation yet, but we're kind of getting there. So the Mars you see now, would make Ansel Adams proud. Rockscapes that are beautiful. And in those rocks are the stories of habitable environments where the microbes of the, on the Earth and the other living things would do great. In fact, the question is, why aren't they there? And even in the, in the majesty of Mars, we have many questions. We think there's buried ice capes, perhaps where microbes could be living. And so the biological frontier of the next 50 years is to ask, are we alone through the lens of Mars? And if we discover that, that will change everything, because that will reflect on who we are as people. Now, beyond Mars, of course, there's a big universe. We've come to see it not just through the eyes of scientists and engineers and technologists, but really through the eyes of people and artists. Look at this. This is the atmosphere of Jupiter, collected by a camera about as big as my hand, 
quite frankly, built by a very close friend of mine, to just kind of take a look. And there is this giant planet Jupiter, almost big enough to have been a sun. Think of our solar system as a binary. You know, that's not Star Trek or Star Wars. That's what it could have been. And yet, we've learned from watching Jupiter and the dynamics of its atmosphere, where the scales here, the Earth would fit in the little black dots up there. The scales are magnificently large, the energy tremendous. There are resources in space, even in the dark of space we don't see, that are available for us as humanity to use. And that business model of the future is going to emerge in the next 50, I, I promise you. Now at Jupiter, we also have some, something so remarkable that it's, it, it makes me shake to talk about it. Some of the moons of Jupiter, including the moon Europa, looks like a cracked uh, cue ball or ice ball, actually harbor oceans bigger than those on Earth. The tail of the ocean worlds is emerging, and they don't always show their surfaces and their faces. They're like a book where you can't judge it by its cover. And what science has shown us is, in this world, ravaged by the radiation of Jupiter, there are oceans under an ice rock crust where biology may have a laboratory, a field day of possibilities. And in the next 50, we, you, will extend ourselves to Europa and to worlds like that, other ocean worlds, to ask, are we alone? Because if we're not, maybe life got smart and went underground. Uh, and that's one of the stories of how we explore for the next 50. And beyond Jupiter, there's, of course, the magic of Saturn. Who doesn't like Saturn? What's really amazing about Saturn in this backlight, backlit image is where the Earth and Moon fit. Looking across a billion kilometers of space were specks of light like stars in the star field you can see. Now that kind of puts it all in perspective because we live and work and play and breathe and operate and do business in space. And yet the scales are mind boggling. And when you look at Saturn here, you realize it has 50 or more moons. We have one. Space is a lot to offer. And as we explore it, we see things about it that we didn't recognize. Most of us thought 20, 30 years ago, Pluto, then the ninth planet, now a dwarf, uh, talk about classification, um, would be fairly uninteresting. 40 times farther from the sun than Earth, Pluto still rocks. And it took imagination and vision and execution to fly by Pluto uh, a couple of summers ago um, through the New Horizons spacecraft and show us a world who has enough internal energy to literally flood itself with liquid hydrocarbons, to make mountains like the Rockies in a world so far from the sun, the amount of energy the sun gives Pluto is equivalent to less than the refrigerator light bulb in your fridge. So Pluto does it by itself. So this universe that we're just coming to know is still in the state of exploratory understanding and that knowledge commodity we need to transform the universe is going to depend on several things. First, realizing we live with a star. This is our sun. This is our solar system. Today, we're just learning how important that is because most of the energy and mass of our little solar system is in that sun. And that sun produces something called space weather. How many of you thought about space weather? You know, it's bad enough worrying about the rain here. Well, we have space weather, which will dictate how we use space ourselves as people, as machines, how it affects our satellites, our GPS, of course, our power grids. The sun is a star we need to use as our point of departure as we look beyond to the majesty of space. Now, you all here are living in what I would call the Hubble age. If you don't know who Sir Edmund Hubble was, great astronomer, we named this school bus sized spacecraft known as the Hubble Space Telescope for him. And Hubble has opened our eyes to the visible ultraviolet universe for the last 30 years. And really, this is the Hubble age. And the question to you all as you react to this foundation of information, of capability, is what will be the next age? Hubble's given us this beautiful cat's eye nebula that shows a star, not unlike ours, unraveling in space things you could not imagine. Science fiction can't even write about them that well, and yet we see them through the cosmic echoes of the light they emit. What this picture doesn't show you is most of the action in the picture is invisible. We only know of it through cosmic messengers. And so the next 50 years is going to be following those messengers to use space in ways that we take advantage of. I think space will become 
a quantum frontier as we learn to use the power of physics. And our next step in space is a gigantic telescope, a cathedral of the mind looking out, not in. And the James Webb Telescope picture here is as big as a tennis court. It's a monument to the, the ingenuity of women and men building something, a, a robotic spacecraft that's of the equivalent magnitude of the Apollo program to the moon. And yes, it's taken us 20 years. But when that telescope sees first light, it'll open our eyes and we will be the web generation and not the web on the internet. And that web generation will influence how we see space. It's named for James Webb. I bet some of you don't know who he was. He was the NASA administrator in the 60s when we got the money to finish Project Apollo and put human beings on the moon. So that next generation in space is going to build on these frontiers, on these learnings, and it's going to give us a new space. And that new space is going to start both near Earth and on the moon as we learn to extend how we think about these places into business model regimes. What will the knowledge commodity, resource commodities, social engineering commodities of being on the moon in a sustainable way be like? Will we be there ourselves? Will we send our kids or our dogs? Or will we be there in an immersive virtual reality that opens that frontier so we can move beyond? The moon is our training ground. Let's embrace it and use it because it's there. And finally, as we look forward, I like to use an artist's rendering of what might be. And this is not what will be. This is what might be. Here's a picture, an artist, if you will, broad, br broad brush of Mars with a woman and her pet drone and robot, uh, rover, working with her as she explores this dynamic world to learn to live in and extend ourselves off planet. A little secret I like to tell people is single planet species don't survive. How we use this opportunity, the moon and Mars, Deep space will depend on our future in space. So let me conclude with a couple of things. First, a great coach once said, this is your time. So the last 50 were we old folks' time. We gave you that first foray into space the way Magellan gave us the first circumnavigation of Earth 500 years ago. And he died trying, but the ships came back. So now, the next 50 is your time. And space is a domain where we will discover the extent of biology beyond ourselves as we move ourselves there and extend ourselves there. That new business model is yours to invent. And so my last catchphrase as I finish is something I think that befits us all, because it's all about space. And that phrase is, never wait to wonder. Thank you.